Hi, it's Bill from Suffolk here on a bright and breezy autumn day in rural England. And this is part two of the series looking at the preparations necessary to get this old go ready for long distance expeditions. And today I'll be looking at four or five different topics, looking under the bonnet, showing some of the mods, the upgrades, and also some of the compromises you have to make. And I think this will be very typical of the sorts of issues facing other owners of similarly aged vehicles. Now this is actually an update for an earlier video with new material. The cooling system is one of the most critical on the vehicle and it's received a lot of attention. First point to note, the Daihatsu engine sits so far back in the engine bay that you can't use a mechanical fan. It would be in quite the wrong place. So you've got to use an electric cooling fan whether you like it or not. Now the standard Land Rover copper radiator rather struggles with this vehicle, particularly when I go to hotter climates. And so a number of years ago I bought an Alisport aluminium radiator and I also treated the vehicle to the matching intercooler. And there's no doubt it does give better cooling. They are absolutely beautifully made, but they are a little bit fragile. And a couple of years ago the radiator developed a small leak and I sent it back to the factory for repair and the copper radiator went back in. And I've done a few trips in the meantime and I have to say that the standard cooling system does struggle. So now I've got the Alisport radiator back, fully repaired, it's gone back in and that is where it's going to stay. And the engine does run cooler and the cooling fan comes on much less often. There's no doubt in my mind that the risk of having a failure in the aluminium radiator is much less than the risk of damaging the engine if I persist with the standard copper radiator. Now to help with the cooling, if you can see them, there are a couple of oil coolers here, gearbox and engine, and I put them in the only place where there's fresh airflow available, which is underneath the front cross member. These are Mokal 13 row units and I have had to modify them in order to squeeze them in. Now for protection of the oil coolers, I've got this underbody bash plate. I have had to modify it. I've had to weld extensions onto the rear mounting point in order to swing it down to create space for the oil coolers. I've also had to cut away at the front to improve the airflow. And this will take care of any major bashes and I've got some stainless steel mesh which lives in front of the coolers themselves which will catch things like flying stones. I think they're actually very well protected and indeed I've had no problems whatsoever in over 200,000 kilometres. But even if the worst comes to the worst and the coolers do get fractured, my contingency plan is I carry a couple of fittings like this and I can offline the coolers by merely joining together the inlet and outlet oil pipes. I think this is far more effective than anything that Land Rover offers. So when it's put back together again, it looks like this and it's quite a busy little area. We have good airflow through to the oil coolers, we've got the bash plate underneath, the protective mesh up here and the two recovery points. I think it's a very effective installation and I think the oil coolers are quite safe up there. If anyone's seen a better installation on a Defender, I'll be very pleased to see your photo. Thank you very much. Now the charging system is another critical system on this vehicle. And this has been through a few iterations to get to its current configuration where it now works very satisfactorily. I have a dual battery system and the total installed capacity is about 150 amp hours. And the standard alternator is a Nippon Denso 60 amp unit which is very well built. This is incidentally about the right size for, this, uh, for charging this battery bank and I have covered this in the other video on this channel about dual battery charging. Now I'm absolutely paranoid about losing the alternator on a long trip so I carry a spare here and indeed I have had to use it on occasions. Now when installed inside the full track this has an external voltage regulator which is a passive unit but this is a bit of a compromise. These are constant voltage units and 
you're either getting very slow charging or if you increase the charging you risk overcharging at the end of a long run and in practice you need a multi-stage charge controller and I've broken my own rule by introducing electronics and I have a smart charge controller. For a number of years I used a driftgate unit made by a small firm in Cambridge, very popular in the marine world, but they went out of business a few years ago, so the unit was no longer supported, and to me this was too much of a risk. So I relegated this to the spare, and I bought a more modern Sterling Pro Reg smart charge controller instead. And I have the two units mounted side by side on a backing plate, and this goes high up underneath the wing. It's quite close to the alternator, it's also very cool there and it's also high enough that it doesn't get flooded even during deep wading so it's a good location for it. Now electronics don't like vibration and so the backing plate, uh, plate has rubber mountings. Now the whole system comes together inside this uh, junction box here and this is the interface between the alternator and the charge controller and there's a six-way terminal block there. I've also got an identical terminal block on the spare driftgate unit and should I need to change out the charge controller it just means moving the cables over on the alternator side like for like and this only takes a few minutes in practice. At the end of the day the system is now working very well and it should be reliable. Now the wiring is probably the least satisfactory part of the whole vehicle. You start with a compromised solution. It is a military Land Rover. I believe the way they built these, they'd take a civilian vehicle and they'd militarise it. Where there are unused circuits, they didn't pull the cabling, but they just disconnect them. So you find loose cable ends flapping around the place, which were a bit disconcerting. And of course a lot of extra wiring went in to do with the winterisation. For example, uh, to the Wabasto, which also has its own diesel lines, of course. Another complicating factor is the fact that it's a hybrid vehicle. We've got to marry together the engine electrical systems with the rest of the body. And of course it's um, got a split charge system. Uh, we have dual batteries and all of the auxiliary circuits uh, which I install myself to the best of my ability. And everything's been labelled up and I've done circuit diagrams so it's properly documented. It would have been very nice to have a main um, distribution centre somewhere in the vehicle but there just isn't the real estate. And so you end up putting in relay holders, fuse boxes, junction boxes, just wherever you can find the space. The ideal would be to rip it all out and start again, but that's not going to happen in my lifetime. On the positive side, I find when I'm out on the road, um, I tend not to get problems. And indeed, if I do, easily fixed. As I said before, there are no electronics. So on balance, the uh, electrical system is probably good enough. Well, given that everything on this vehicle is a good 20 to 30 years old, anything which can be removed for refurbishment has to be refurbished. So this includes, for example, the starter motor, the power steering pump, the alternator, the injection pump and the injectors and this list of course excludes everything underneath the vehicle to do with the suspension and transmission which will be the subject of later videos. Well that's it for today. I hope this video gives you some idea of what's necessary to keep an old vehicle like this running and indeed to prepare it for overland expeditions. I'm off to Portugal soon. I hope it's going to be a lot warmer down there than it is here in chilly old Britain. I will of course be doing a lot of interesting off-roading down there and it's a great country for that. Bye for now.